Welcome back. God bless. Glad you're joining us on this uh, Wednesday night. Uh, this week we're Wednesday on our weekly lecture. Tonight we're going to be talking about the acquisition of the virtues according and well within we see within the life and the virtues of Saint Paisius the Athenite, continuing with uh, the great saint and the life of the saint. We'll also be talking about the nature of the acquisition of the virtues. And a little bit, a little bit introductory. It's a vast topic, and uh, we'll just touch the surface tonight, but hopefully we'll pique your interest to go deeper and look forward to your questions. Let's go right to the prayer. Everybody can see me, hear me. Looks like everything's good. Greetings. Good evening. Everybody over at uh, uh, Crowdcast, we're streaming over at Orthodox Ethos. Uh, we did not get a, a notice out to the folks, which I can do real quick here, um, everybody at Patreon, but uh, we did did post that at Patreon. Hopefully you saw that, that we were going to be doing it uh, this week. But let's see if we can get one out real quick, because uh, I see that there's probably some people who didn't uh, didn't get the uh, didn't get the message. So let me just do that real quick and get get a message out to everybody a text message because i can do that really quick so let's do that one second bear with me okay One second, everybody. From the life of Saint Paisios. All right. All right, let's go to the prayer, and we'll be right back with you. Let's see the prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Illumine our hearts, O Master, who lovest mankind with the pure light of the divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our minds to the understanding of the gospel teaching. And plan us also feel that blessed commandment to trample down all kind of desires. We may enter upon a spiritual man of living, both thinking and doing such things will please unto thee. Without the illumination of our souls and bodies with Christ our God, unto thee we ascribe glory, together with the Father from the last, the good and life creating spirit, will now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Evlogito si Christeo Theo Simon O pan sofus Tu salis anadixas Canta pemsas aftis topnema O Aegeon Kedri Afton Tinikumeni Saeginem Sans Philanthrope Thoksa Si Amen. Well, happy feast to all those on the new calendar. Tonight we're celebrating the Vespers for the feast tomorrow on the 20th of the prophet Elias. Uh, dear to us uh, because we served in the parish of the prophet Elias in Petrochetus of Greece up in the mountains for about 12 years. And great grace, great universal, diachronic, unique saint. If you don't know much about him, you haven't spent time reading his life, highly, highly recommend you take the opportunity. Uh, now, if you're on the new calendar, in 13 days on the old, and uh, and spend some time and get to know Prophet Elias, extremely important, uh, uh, both for the old and new covenant, for the beginning and the end of history, or at least the, the, the old uh, covenant and the end of history, he will return before the second coming of Christ and preach repentance and be martyred. And he's such an amazing figure, really a, 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 
prototype of monasticism in some ways, the first uh, form of monasticism in the old covenant, a great ascetic and just an amazing image and figure in, of, uh, of, of virtue. And of course, so many, so many interesting things in his life as with regard to the faithfulness of the servants of God, how God appears and speaks to people, the still small voice and so much more. So highly recommend you take some time. There is a great lecture. I don't think it's in English. To my, I don't recall it ever being translated in English, but if you know Greek, uh, one of the best uh, contemporary uh, analysis of his life is by Elder Athanasius Metelineos on the prophet Elias. But uh, there's um, a lot in the five volumes on the book of Revelation. He talks a bit about him there. And, and, and of course, uh, the great Synax Aristis, if you have that, it has a has uh, everything you need. But uh, so that's a uh, happy feast, everyone, on the new calendar. God help us to the prophet and to the prayers of the prophet. Now, a few introductory words about a, a acquisition of the, of the virtues. Uh, we need to, first of all, say that in the Orthodox Church, in the Church of Christ, with our Lord, as opposed to the popular idea and definitely opposed to the humanistic uh, mentality, the virtues are not acquired. This is, takes a little bit to get our head around it. They're not acquired piecemeal. They're not acquired one by one. The virtues are not acquired um, by our efforts. We're going to, let's see, today uh, I'm going to, uh, or this week or next this month, I'm going to work, work, work on being patient. And then by the end of the month, I'm going to master patience. And then I'm going to move on. I'm going to master, you know, um, uh, alienation from the world and being out of this world. And then I'm going to move on and I'm going to master uh you know, fasting and um, and abstinence. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. And in fact, all the virtues that we acquire simply by human effort in whatever degree we think we have acquired them, which is always going to be inadequate and piecemeal, uh, they are they're not ultimately uh, salvific because in the context of our relationship with Christ, which everything is a gift, uh, they are um, communicated to us as a gift and as a whole, and they are the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. In other words, acquisition of the Holy Spirit, acquisition of the Holy Spirit is the, is the as they say in Greek, the zetumeno, that which is sought after, that which is necessary, is we, we're not seeking the virtues autonomously per se, but we're seeking the spirit of God to dwell in us. And that love of God is what then is uh, able to make room for, or let's say give birth within us, uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And then with the presence of the Holy Spirit, he brings all the virtues. Now, our assimilation of those and the manifestation of those, of course, due to our weakness and, and our inadequacy and our inconsistency, is going to be coming and going. It's going to be piecemeal. It's going to appear piecemeal, let's say. It's going to appear to the people as, as coming and going. But uh, if, it's really the, if it's really the virtues that, that, that are... Um, connected to and a fruit of salvation, uh, they cannot be they cannot be split apart into pieces. And here's here's a way to try to understand this better. When we go to Holy Communion and we commune with the Holy Mysteries, the priest does not impart the Eucharist to us and say, here is a piece of the Holy Communion. This is a piece of the body of Christ. A portion. The servant of God, uh, Mary, partakes of a portion of the body and blood of Christ. It doesn't say that. There is no division. There's no possibility of division. Christ is one and always 
one. Every last tiniest particle is all of Christ. So he partakes of the body and blood of Christ. And this is a mystery, of course, to our rationalistic mindset, but this is how it must be. And in the same way, the, when we talk about the, the grace of God, the divine energies, we talk about the divine energies, the operations of the, of the uh, Christ, I mean, the Holy Spirit or God's spirit within us, the uncreated grace of God. It is simple and indivisible. And yet the saints talk about it being di indivisibly divided among individual creatures. And we talk about the divine energies being different. In other words, their manifestation in us are, is different, even though it's simple and one. So the Holy, the grace of God, the uncreated grace of God that comes and dwells in us and makes us abode in us, as the Lord says in the gospel, what does he say? And I will come and make my abode with the Father and the Spirit within you. All right, that communion uh, is on the one hand indivisible, simple, and total. And on the, one hand, on the other hand, it manifests itself within us and within the world as many different kinds of energies or operations and fruits. Uh, we, if you pay attention to the Feast of Pentecost, you'll see this whole theology laid out in the prayers, especially of the priest. So, again, as you read in St. Seraphim of Seraph's great, uh, let's say, a revelation that he gave to uh, Motilov, uh, the question is not a, uh, being a good boy and girl. The question is not being a good person. The question is not, and the, the zetumino, the, that which is sought out, is not uh, being a moral, kind you know, generous person, these these various characteristics that we see and that we we uh, enjoy and we uh, put even praise in people. That is not what's uh, what's sought and what's at stake, but rather the acquisition of the Holy Spirit or the uncreated presence of God, the uncreated energies of God within us, and then all of the fruits of that communion are uh, the virtues and the, and the gifts of God that come to some of the more uh, advanced and glorified. Uh, so we could also say the same thing about the commandments of Christ. What are the commandments of Christ? The commandments are life. My words are life, he says. Uh, the commandments are not uh, moral teachings that we try to put into place or, or, or we try to be, you know, struggle to be perfect and be better the next day uh, than we were the previous day uh, on a human level. What, what are the commandments? They're, they're essentially the, uh, divine words or energies of God that come that when we struggle to keep them, uh, God dwells within us. So the, the commandments are observed as a whole and not, uh, let's say, um, chosen by us one by one. Uh, we're, we're not, and that's, this is a proper way to understand it, we're not in a cafeteria and we go through and choose the kind of commandments we want to 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 keep and others that we don't want to keep or we can't keep. Uh, but they're, they're obtained all together uh, as a whole. And, and it's, it's the same as the virtues. Uh, let me read you something from uh, the book of my professor uh, who I studied under, who's a tremendous uh, dogmatic theologian who, who was, um, close to and visited many times St. Paisios, uh, St. Ephraim of Katonakia, uh, and, um, and other saints of our day. And he says um, the following, uh, the virtues, I'm going to repeat, be a little repetitive, but I think it's important for us to, to nail this down, because otherwise we won't understand St. Paisios and the saints. We won't understand how this works, right? He says that the 
the virtues are a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And the, the activated spirit of his kingdom is, is, the, is, is how they are realized within us. In other words, the spirit himself realizes the virtues within us. Virtue which does not happen for the grace, for the love of God. Virtue, which does not come about as a fruit or is in the process of the love of Christ and does not express this love has in and of, in of itself no value for the faithful. And neither is it a fruit of the Holy Spirit. If you read, for instance, the if you read, for instance, the teachings of St. Ignatius Branseninov, he has some very good and sharp, strong words about humanism and how all of the goodness, quote-unquote, or virtues, quote-unquote, that we see among the humanists, the atheists, the whatever, people who are not loving, uh, seeking to love God and serve God and, and, and struggle for God, that, in fact, um, none of that is salvific. None of that is, leads us to communion with Christ, right? It's not in the context of a relationship with Christ. It's not for Christ and in Christ, like we say here uh, in, repeatedly. It has to be for Christ and in Christ. It has to be according to Christ. And so Christ is the truth and the life and is the absolute fullness. We talk about the fullness of Christ, the fullness of the church. And this is one of the big misconceptions in among the mission field of the Orthodox today, among the English speakers in America. People say, I've come to the fullness of, of the faith, the fullness of the truth in orthodoxy. And I embrace now the church, the Orthodox church, as the fullness. And they understand it quantitatively. They understand it like, well, as a Protestant or as a papal Protestant, what I had was 90%, 70%, whatever, of the truth. In other words, the they got most of the dogmas or maybe a lot of the dogmas perhaps correct or whatever, right? It doesn't really matter. It's just, but they, quanti they quantify. Well, we didn't have the priesthood, but now we have the priesthood. Or we didn't have this teaching about Mary, but now I understand Mary, this. And now I've come to the fullness. I had like a partial Christian life, a partial incomplete Christian experience. Now I have the full uh, Christian experience. What's wrong with that? Well, we understand that on one level that we're, Requiring and accepting, let's say, the all the teachings that have been handed down to us, the dogmatic teachings. Yeah, I understand that that's the fullness in the sense of we don't have we don't have like a missing doctrine, you know, or we don't have an additional doctrine like you know a false doctrine like papal infallibility or something. But but that's that's not that it has to do with a um, intellectual and a, and a, and a, a, a external, let's say acceptance of everything that's been taught but all of the, the whole purpose of those teachings is to lead us into a life and an experience and 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 a um uh, a living relationship and so that uh person and that experience that we're talking about the the commandments the virtues christ himself is only fullness Right, Christ is not. There can't be a partial Christ anywhere. There can't be a, a little bit of Christ. I, I had an experience of Christ a little bit. Right, you might, you know, stand and appreciate the teachings of Christ. You might read the Bible and 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 love the Bible. And that's not an experience of Christ. Right, that's an, that's a that's that's a presupposition for the experience. But the experience happens only within a face to face you know, uh, immediate relationship with Christ. And that happens only in the church. In other words, his body. In other words, in the mysteries. So the existential, ontological, as you like, or the, the, the you know, the, the experiential reality of Christ, just like you and I, has to be entered into on a personal basis. And has to be, we have to commune with him. And that communion happens in the mysteries of the church and the presuppositions for that are, is the wholeness, the fullness of the faith, the 
presuppositions of that is to have and to experience the fullness of the faith, but it's not the same as the fullness, right? In other words, I could have all the doctrines correct, like the like the EOC did, the Evangelical Orthodox Church before they became Orthodox. They did they imitated everything in the church. They did divine liturgy. They did they they did everything outside the church, imitating the Orthodox Church, thinking, well, we're Orthodox. But until they were united in the mysteries to the church, Christ was still something they had not entered into and experienced as fullness. In other words, he's only fullness. When we talk about pleroma in Greek, plerotita, there's not a, there's not a, it's not a quantitative thing. It's a, it's a description of the person of Christ, the reality of Christ. It's not a quantitative thing we can have a little bit of. And there's so many, I think a lot of people, even Orthodox people, still think in those terms. It seems like I'm, I'm just, I'm really trying to work it out myself, trying to experience, understand how people are. But this is my experience over the years that they've, they've turned it into a quantitative thing. So Christ is is the fullness, and there is no nothing less than that, right? So, Tamara, you cannot hear us? Only you see the text. You can't hear me speaking? That's too bad. That's strange. Does anybody else have that problem? Yeah, that's a bizarre, bizarre problem to have. I'm sorry to hear that. Yes, yes, Alexandra, exactly. It's an organic reality. It's like it's, you're a human being. You know, you can hear about Alexandra. You can read about Alexandra. You can come to appreciate her life, read her history, right? But you, unless you meet her, unless you sit down and eat at the same table with Alexandra, you still have yet to really understand. And still then you don't, right? Still then you can go deeper and deeper and deeper over a long, over eternity. And uh, so he is the absolute fullness and he is imparted charismatically, that means in the hotism of the grace of God in the mysteries of the church, as totalness or fullness or completeness. That's how we understand it, right? So you can't have the light uh, and then a part of you not be enlightened. Right? You can't have the light, be in communion with the light, the light be you know, in you, dwelling in you, and then a part of you be in darkness. And that darkness would be, in other words, that which is contrary to the grace of God. These things don't go good. The spirit of truth does not dwell where there's falsehood, for instance. We can understand that, right? That the spirit of truth doesn't rest in the liar, right? The one who's the son of the father of lies has nothing to do with the spirit of truth, for example. We can understand that, I think. Well, it's like that in many other ways, too. Uh, you can't have the light and then have a big part of a part of you just be in total darkness. Let's see. Uh, you can't, let's say, you can't at the same time be restored to health, communion with God, and at the same time be full of sickness and disease. In other words, be uh, not in communion with God. Like it's, it, it's, it's, we, we talk about a woman who is pregnant. This is an easy one to grasp. Is there anybody who's partially pregnant? Either have the life in you, the baby is in you, the life is in you, it's dwelling, it's, it's, it's nurtured, or it's not. Right? It's not like, well, I have a partial life within me. Right? It's either one or the other. So the, the aim here, just to wrap it up and then go down to St. Paisios, the aim here is to become conscious on our part now. This is the human end of this divine human synergy. What do we bring to the table? Well, the first thing and most important thing is to be completely conscious the greatness of our sin, of our missing the mark, and the corruption or the distortion uh, of our distortion from God, right? That's the first and foremost and most basic thing. And 
to keep his commandments, all of his commandments, to, to, to be about that. That's our life. What are his commandments? You go through the scriptures, you read his commandments, you see all of his, and we're not just talking about the Old Testament Ten Commandments, obviously, we're talking about the Christ's words and teachings. So that we can see in this present life that the words of our Lord regarding his charismatic presence, him, his within us, him coming and abiding in us and bringing the Father and the Spirit and dwelling us, that they become true, that he comes and dwells in us, and the and his kingdom is activated within us. In other words, the presence of the Holy Spirit, which brings all the virtues, is manifest and and and, and, and made manifest and made present within us. Now, in the life of Saint Paisios, why do we study the lives of the saints? Because that's how we learn in practice how the commandments of God are lived out, how one becomes uh, what we're all seeking, and that is to be, have the kingdom of God energized, activated, present within us. So if you have the life of the saint by Elder Isaac, the one that we translated, or I helped translate along with Bishop Alexi of Alaska, who, by the way, by the way, let me actually stop and just say that because we're really excited. It just came in the mail today. Let me share that with you. We have a uh, the first in a series. We have the first in a, in our series of booklets, topical booklets. We have the very first one by His Grace Bishop Alexi of of Alaska, who was with me in Greece, studied in Greece, and is the co-translator of the life of Saint Paisios with me. He did the bulk of the work, actually. Uh, we have a, a, a new pamphlet that we've just published. Let's just show that so we can get that. There we go. See that? Can everybody see that? Helmet of Salvation. Helmet of Salvation, a new uh, tap, topical booklet from Uncle Mountain Press. And this is the... It's just a short little homily that the, the bishop did for us, but I want to show it to you. Can you see that? Let's see. Can you see that? I want to make sure everybody gets gets to see that. Plenty of time. Read that. Helmet of Salvation, a defense against scandal, suspicion, and envy by Bishop Alexi of Alaska. And uh, it is all about... There we go. It is all about the blessing that comes to the woman who wears a head covering in the presence of God in the church in imitation of the Most Holy Theotokos. It's really a very beautiful homily. This moved all of us, and we set out quickly to produce the first of a series of booklets that we're going to be producing and eventually make available as a as a set to parishes. And that is the first one. I think it's going to be fantastic. So that's Father Alexi, then now Bishop Alexi of Alaska, who's the co-translator on this uh, book that we're looking at tonight. So St. Paisios, uh, in the book, if you have it there, after the life, we have part two. And the first of the sections, there's three sections, uh, virtues, spiritual gifts, and offerings, and in the virtue section, I think this is where if you have the book and you want to do some serious studying, uh, read again this whole section from page 347 to 491. It's a book in itself, 150 pages. Uh, well, more than 150 pages, yeah, 157, seven, eight pages. And they go through the various virtues that they saw manifest in the life of St. Paisius. And we're just going to read through them real quick for those of you who don't have the book. 
And it starts with utter estrangement from the world. I'm going to say a few words about that. First step, if you've read the Ladder of Divine Ascent, this is the first step on the ladder. Estrangement from the world. Second is obedience. Then the wealth of humility. Then the worker and preacher of repentance. Non-possessiveness, in other words, voluntary poverty. An unquenchable thirst for asceticism. Quote, and we labor working with our hands, our own hands, unquote. The, the aroma of reverence, which we talked about last week. He loved righteousness. This is a part, this is like sections of this whole uh, chapter on virtue. Eager goodness, which we're going to talk about tonight, which is the word in Greek, philotimo. Philotimo, you've heard that term, I hope. Uh, that's very important in the life of St. Paisus, but all the saints. Trust in divine providence, an angel of peace, a lamp of discernment, a lover of stillness, watchfulness, his rule of prayer, dispassion, and noble love. So I want you to ask yourself, how many of these virtues have I even thought about, let alone understood as uh, expressions of my life in Christ and the fruits of, my, of the presence of the Holy Spirit? You do know that of the greatest, the greatest of the virtues, let's, talk, let's start at the top, the greatest of the virtues considered by in the Desert Fathers, at least in the Yerodikon, is discernment. When the fruit of the whole spiritual life is discernment of the spirits. A lamp of discernment is one of the late, last sections. Of course, love is also considered the greatest of the virtues. Uh, and dispassion, apathia, of course, the fruit of all the spiritual life as well. All these things, we tend to try to make it a, a rigid hierarchy, but really they're all, again, one whole. They're, 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 they're inseparable. But certainly you can talk about a, a hierarchy, I think, over time of them being manifest in one's life. But um, the word we're going to talk about tonight is philotimo. Philotimo. <clears throat> Juan Dong, do you have the book? Do you have the life of St. Paisios? How many tonight, why don't we do a poll real quick here in the crowdcast. How many of you have the life of St. Paisios? I, I, I may be operating on the assumption that a lot of you have the life, and that's my may be a bad assumption. So do you, let's just put it up there as a question. Do you, do you have... The life of Saint Aisios of Mount Athos by Elder Isaac. Uh, and uh, yes, no, uh, about to get it, uh, purchase it. Okay, there you go. So let's give me some feedback. Let's just get a sense of everybody tonight. How many of you have the life of Saint Paisos? I just put up the poll there in uh, in Crowdcast. Let, let's get a sense of it. Uh, I see that there's already three questions. You can go ahead and move over there if you have your question ready and you want to ask your question. Go ahead and uh, put it in the question box. John has listened to the life of the from the audio cha channel on Telegram, Athenite Audio, but I don't have the book. That's great. I'm glad to know that they have that and they've read that. That's in Telegram, right? Yeah. I, I've been there. I have that as well. I don't, I don't get much time to read, to hear those books, but that's wonderful. They've got it. The Big Green Book. That's correct. This is the old version. This is the old version here, right? But now the new version has the icon of St. Paisius. Uh, and so if you don't have it, I really highly recommend you get it. So this section on the virtues is where we're going to be spending some time tonight. And maybe if you, if it's beneficial for you, and I'll put a poll up tonight before we end, is this where you want me to head? Talk more and more about the virtues and the life of St. Paisius. I think it's very valuable, but there's so much one can always deal with. So I'm not sure if this is the, you know, the best, but hopefully... Uh, you'll be benefited tonight. So the first step, as we said, is utter estrangement from the world. 
And this takes the form in the monastic life. <clears throat> Just one moment. In the monastic life, this takes the form immediately of estrangement from those close to you in the world. In other words, your family. So when the monk leaves his family to go become a monk in a monastery, what happens? Well, first and foremost, he has to cut himself off from that human relationship. In other words, instead of having a brother or sister or five brothers and sisters and a mother and a father, he makes the world, the whole entire world and everyone he meets into his brother and sister. And the especially the whole life of the church becomes, and the, the, I say the whole community of the church becomes his family. And so one has to detach himself from those human bonds in order to recommit and reconnect himself to every human being and see everyone as his brother and his sister. And so that's the, one of the first and foremost steps for a monk. If he does not do that, he will not make great progress in the spiritual life. He has to become like Christ, who says in the gospel, somewhere in the gospel, which we read on the Feast of the, of the, feast of the Most Holy Theotokos, very interestingly, they interpreted all wrong by the Protestants, by the way, the, the passage I'm going to tell you. Um, they come to him and they say to the Lord, and they say, uh, your, your mother and your brothers are outside. And he says something like, my brother and my mother are those who keep the word of God. You know, I'm not, I don't see my brother and my mother as them alone, these human relationships, but everyone that keeps the word of God. And that's exactly what we see in the life of St. Paisus and the goal of every monastic. And frankly, it's the goal of every Christian ultimately to see, to get beyond these human ties, to see everyone uh, and the image of God in everyone. and how we are all children of God and brothers and sisters in Christ. So that's the first step in the first section here uh, of all the virtues. I'm not going to dwell too much on this because it's a bit repetitive, frankly. The, they th give a lot of examples of how he lived out this estrangement. Okay, Zhuang Dong, you saw that lecture. Good, you, but you don't have the, you don't have the book. It looks like, unless I missed it. Did you say something earlier that I didn't see? No. Okay. All right, so I want to read just one section. When, when monks asked the elder about relationships with relatives, he would say to them, we shouldn't be attached to them. Those relationships are a human consolation. But as monks, we should be looking for consolation from God. A monk who loves his parents a lot stays undeveloped spiritually. The Lord does not give him the gift of feeling that everyone is his relative so that he could love everyone the same. Besides, we promise to distance ourselves from our relatives for the love of Christ. What does the Lord say in the gospel, which applies to every one of us? He who loves mother or father or brother or sister more than me is not worthy of me. You see how the monastic life and the monastic struggle and the are just the gospel put into practice. I was just uh, talking to someone today. Actually, two people wrote me about a quote, quote that has been put online. Let me see if I can find it. It's, a, it's really pertinent to our discussion tonight. There was a a quote put online um, let's see if I can find it and it was from Saint Ignatius Briancheninov and two people wrote me about it and said well what's this I don't understand this quote how do you make sense of this because he was saying that the uh, just bear with me. I need to find it. It's um, uh, 
Mm. Yes, I found it. Uh, let me read you the quote from St. Ignatius Brown Zeno. A Christian who lives in the world should not read the Holy Fathers who wrote for those living in monasteries. What use is it to read about virtues which cannot one cannot achieve in the world? There could be no benefit, perhaps, even some harm may come of this exercise. So people wrote me and said, what's going on with this quote? And I said, well, it's taken out of context, first of all. Uh, Lori, the, the polls are right to the right here. There's a little question mark there. Uh, no, that's the question. Sorry, the polls are just below the questions. A little like graph. And we have results of the poll, and it's 50-50. 50%, well, it's actually 40% said yes, I've I have the book, 40% says no, and then eight, let's see, uh, no, I'm 16% say uh, I want to get the book. I'm going to get it. Okay, so that's, that's about even. Everybody's kind of falls evenly uh, throughout here. Despina has her hand raised. Is that intentional? Do you want to ask a question? Uh, beyond the question box, Despina. So this quote is kind of, uh, first of all, it's outside of the context of the book, which is misleading. It does not, I think, communicate as is the truth of the whole matter. And so we have to see it in context. Otherwise, we're going to misunderstand it. I think there are particular writings of, of monastics which presuppose that the reader has knowledge of the monastic life. That's what he's referring to. But we cannot say that there are virtues that do not apply to everyone. I don't think we can talk about virtues that, because ultimately there's only one path, one gospel, one uh, narrow road, uh, and everything in the gospel that the monk is trying to put into practice, we need to try to put into, put into practice. Now, obviously, there are some basic differences, and I think this is the point of the quote, but it's not, it's misleading uh, when it's not in context. And that is that those who are married and have children are having, obviously, relations and bringing forth children, and monks do not do that, obviously. And the monks also are non-possessors. They do not desire or want to have any possessions. Whereas people in the world have to take possessions for the sake of the caring for uh, the children and the and the whole uh, uh, passing life that we have in this earth and in this society in order to take care of uh, of one another and uh, have the, the basics of life. We have to work, we have to have houses and all the rest. Whereas monks eschew all that. Of course, the monastery obviously doesn't eschew all that. They have to have those basics, but the monastic himself does not claim any of that for himself. So obviously that's a difference as well. And then the level and intensity of obedience between the monastic and the person in the world is going to be different. But obedience as a virtue to acquire is not different. So it's the way and the context that's different, but not the essence of the acquisition of the virtues in different and we see that in the lives of many contemporary saints. I don't know if you've seen the three volumes. I think there's only one or two volumes in English. There's three in Greek. Ascetics in the World, produced by, by the way, this same elder and his brotherhood that gave us the life of St. Paisa. So they clearly did not see that the ascetics, that there's a great, great chasm between monastics and ascetics in the world. They produced three books, collections of ascetics in the world who clearly had great virtues, great grace, and and they saw as holy and saints. They're, there's not, they don't make these sharp distinctions. I think you see that in, a lot, in the monasteries of Elder Ephraim in, in, in America. There's really almost one big community, monastic and lay, and Elder Ephraim even told me personally and others how there's, there's this family, this community that's inseparable, and one uh, supports the other in different ways. Obviously, they're different but they're one in Christ in the life, and the path is one in Christ. So um, we need also to acquire that love of Christ and make sure that we don't love anyone in this world more than he. And I liked how the elder says here, the relationships are, are, are a human consolation. 
But as monks, we should be looking for consolation from God. That is applicable to every one of us. Every one of us has to graduate to seek and, and, and desire and look only to God for consolation. Consolation, everyone is seeking consolation. There's not a human being on the face of the earth that's not seeking consolation. From the most mundane things to the most amazing and profound things, most human beings spend most of their life seeking for consolation. And let's just give us some, a few examples. Well, Lori, thank you so much for that. Fantastic. The uh, uh, My one-year-old grandson went un unresponsive on July 12th last week. July 12th, of course, that's the Feast of St. Paisios. Um, he was airlifted to a children's hospital. He was intub intubated and on a ventilator to breathe. All his tests came back negative. He was ex extubated and breathing on his own by that evening and discharged in perfect condition with no defi deficient heart. 36 hours later, our Orthodox community asked for St. Paisius to intervene. Now I want to know more about it. And that's fantastic. Of course. What a great, what a great, wonderful thing. Uh, St. Paisius is alive and interceding as all the saints are. Glory to God. Um, so the consolations, brothers and sisters, that's what we're all about. I mean, let's think about it. Every day, I'm down here in Arizona. It's 111 degrees or, or even 115, 117 it reached. You go outside, you're quickly looking for consolation, right? You're looking for a glass of water. You're looking to go inside where there's air conditioning. I mean, from the most mundane to the most exalted things, we are spending our life looking for consolation. And so where do we put our heart? Where do we, are we estranged from the consolation offered by the world? That's what this first step is. That's the first step on the ladder of the virtues. That you're seeking consolation from God and you're not and you're not interested in or you're not even seeking or trying to get consolation from the world. So that means you're fasting, you're doing vigil. These are things that show that we're about consolation from God and not from this world, right? The people in the world, they seek consolation from pleasure, whatever produces pleasure, whatever gives us pleasure, right? But mostly today, because we're so fallen, I mean, in a even you know more fallen than other generations. Uh, we might, I think Philip Sherrard is right in that, that we've gone through a kind of second fall in the last 500 years. But in any case, uh, we have a kind of uh, a desire for pleasure and an escape from reality. So we go to drugs, we go to sexual pleasure, we go to entertainment. There's tons of opportunities for fake, false, passing, deceptive consolation which will not give us true, uh, true consolation in our heart, in our whole person, and that will last forever, right? So that's why it's so important those, in those things that are closest to us, and the things that are close to us are our mother, father, brother, sister, and then what's other, what, what other thing we need all the time everywhere, you know, to be able to continue to live in this world? Nutrition, food, drink, and and you see in those two areas whether one is whether one is on the path of consolation from God or still seeking consolation from this world. We, I I personally and I can't speak for anybody else, but we're constantly falling into consolation for the body and the soul. We think about. Also, but not that much, maybe secondarily, maybe we, we're content with uh, doing the externals, right? So this is the difference between a sinner like me and a saint like St. Saint Paisios, is that he's looking for consolation from God, and he spends his night and day in the presence of God, praying for, and, and working out uh, uh, that that relationship is the most important thing, right? There's nothing more important then receiving, seeking and receiving consolation from God. All right, now let's get, we're going to jump and we're going to move to a section called Eager Goodness. Very short. 
but I'm going to read the whole thing and then we're going to talk about it and then we can open up for questions. So uh, it's the section in Greek called Philotimo, which is, I think, um, uh, one of the most important things we need because Philotimo, how can I express this? I think that living in Greece for 20 years, I saw that there were a lot of people who had Philotimo. And I don't even know if they ever thought about it. I don't even know if they even realized it or even thought, well, I'm Philotimo, I'm seeking Philotimo. It was in the society, in the blood, in the community. It was something that was passed down to people who weren't even struggling for spiritual life many times. Or they were just taking it for granted, right? They didn't really understand it. They didn't pray much. But they had seen so many examples in the older generation of Philotimo, right? Because people in the 20th century, the children and the grandchildren of the refugees coming from Asia Minor, for instance, you know, millions of refugees from Asia Minor that's filled up uh, the villages around Thessaloniki and, and, and all over Greece, they suffered a lot, right? They were, they were refugees, they suffered a lot. And in that suffering and that simplicity and that poverty, actually Philotimo is much more cultivated and, and even easier in a way you, when you co-suffer with everybody with you, there's a camaraderie and there's a oneness and there's a love uh, that's cultivated. When you're, when you're self-sufficient, when, you're, when you have ease and you have the money you need and you, you can be isolated from your brother and sister, you don't cultivate philotimo, right? It's not going to happen. You got to go out of your way to do that. So philotimo is a hugely important thing for us because we live in a society and we're inheritors of a way of life for the last 100, 150 years in America, at least 100 years, which is extremely materialistic, pampered, and there's ease and comfort is, is elevated. It's, it's exalted, right? Ease and comfort is exalted as, as a sign of uh, progress, a sign of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, a way of life that is American, right? So nobody really questions it, and we have all that. And so we're fighting against the grain to obtain that which was, as it was, second nature uh, to other people in older generations and in Greece. And it's changing in Greece, unfortunately, because of the European Union and, the, and, and the many other things, apostasy of many people. So they, we translated it. I, this was not actually my choice. I don't remember it being my choice, but I accepted it. Eager goodness. Philotimo as eager goodness. I... I don't think that really captures philotimo, but that's what we ended up with. It's very difficult to translate philotimo. Literally, it means the love of honor, right? Um, let me just read a, a definition that we gave and the, tr the translators of this volume gave, and uh, maybe that'll help some people, all right? So, Uh, philotimo is a word which cannot be simply translated. It literally means the love of honor, and in modern Greek it refers to the active love of the good for its own sake. The active love of the good for its own sake, for the sake of Christ, really, because he's, there's only one good, right? That's God. Especially as this is manifest in selfless giving. As the author notes, the antidote is highly illustrative. Uh, in the uh, text here on page 24 is where I'm reading the definition. They're, they're, take, they're talking about the context here. And St. Paisus is talking about uh, the vision of Christ that he had as a child. And he says in this vision after, um, he, he, he's, well, let me just tell the story. This is important. He's challenged by, a younger boy there, a friend of his brother's, with the, the with the ideas of Darwin and how Christ is just a man, right? So Arianism, and he's a young boy. He's impressed. He's, he's he's been you know kind of pressured or pushed around a little bit by this this other boy challenging him, and he goes and he prays and he says to himself after much prayer, much much attempt to to see God and receive from God assurance of his divine humanity. He says, I can accept that Christ is an important man, righteous and virtuous, who has, who was hated out of his envy for his virtue and condemned by his countrymen. 
And I said to myself, since that's how Christ was, even if he was only a man, he deserves my love, obedience, and self-sacrifice. I don't want paradise. I don't want anything. It's worth making every sacrifice for the love, for the sake of his holiness and his kindness. All right. So this um, this stance of this young boy, St. Paisios, is, look, I mean, I can't, I don't have personal experience yet of Christ's divinity, but I don't care. I'm going to live for him anyway because he deserves everything. The person of Christ is so... Uh, wonderful, that no matter what he is, I'm going to live for him, right? I'm not, I don't want anything in return. I don't want paradise. I just want to live for Christ. So then Christ appeared to him at that point in a great light. And he was visible from his waist up. He looked on me with a tremendous love and said to me, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, shall he shall yet live. And he was holding up the gospel in his left hand, where the same words were written. All right, so this is when he was totally solidified in the divine humanity of Christ. And that phrase, I don't want paradise, I don't want anything, I just want to live for him. His holiness, his goodness are worth every sacrifice all on their own. All right, that stance is characterized by the author here as flotimo. I don't want anything. I don't want paradise. I just want to live and sacrifice for the sake of Christ. So this phrase, eager goodness, philotimo, has been chosen by the by the translators to convey the active sense and the sincerity that that the word implies. Okay, so whatever it is, it's it's an attempt to try to capture philotimo. I think it's weak, but what can you do? <clears throat> Justin says, doing honorable things without any apparent personal benefit is very confusing for us Americans. <laughs> yes, of course, but it's always self-interest. That's the problem in America. All right, so philotimo, brothers and sisters, eager goodness. Is goodness reverently, this is, a, this is how the elder defines it, right? What is philotimo? It's goodness reverently distilled the love of humble people the love of humble people cleaned and polished until it shines their hearts are full of gratitude towards god and their fellow man and because they're spiritually sensitive they try to repay every even the smallest good they receive they try to repay even the smallest good that they receive This virtue characterized everything the elder did. From his simple acts of helping others to his self-sacrifice in wartime for the safety of his comrades to his monastic struggles, which exceeded the bounds of his endurance. So if you read the life of the saint, what you see from his childhood to his time in the army, to his time as a layman and among his family, to his monastic struggles, I mean, during his novitiate, when he was at Esfigmeno, he was a superhuman struggle, unbelievable. And he was just a young monk, not even tantric yet. And he was struggling and, and sleeping just a little bit. And put, you know, he put his feet up on his bed, on his chair and he would go to bed for, you know, whatever, an hour. And then right back at it. I mean, it was unbelievable, the struggle he had. Right? You, you got to have a, a tremendous amount of love for Christ to struggle day in and day out. I, I'm reading this because going back to what we said earlier tonight, you acquire the virtues all together. They're fruit of the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's what we see in the life of St. Paisus. He had that love of Christ, which, which defined his whole life, and, and it turned him into a continuous expression of philotimo, and therefore the virtues would shine forth through him because he had the presence of the Holy Spirit within him. Right, very different than that person's very generous and gives a lot of money because he's a philanthropist. Okay, that's not the same thing at all. Here we're talking about inner transformation as opposed to an act or of goodness or kindness or philanthropy or whatever. Right? There'll be plenty of that, even in the time of Antichrist. Listen to me, even in the time of Antichrist, there will be plenty of examples of people being. Philanthropic 
loving mankind, but not for the sake of Christ, not for the sake of eternal life, not because they believed in God, not because they saw God and they see God's image in man, but for all the other reasons why people want to build utopia. So it's really important. It's for Christ and in Christ if it's Christian and if it's salvific. Being a monk, he didn't feel it was enough to go to church services and perform his ascetic rule and have a peaceful conscience from having fulfilled his monastic duties. That's the equivalent of people who say, I'm religious, I go to church every Sunday. Right? He didn't want that. He didn't feel that was sufficient. I go to church, I do my rule, and I'm, my conscience is clean, and I'm, I'm living the monastic life. That's enough. I go have my coffee and tea in the afternoon, with, talk to my fellow monks, and it'll be wonderful. I'll read my book, and it'll be quaint and beautiful and peaceful. He didn't want that. He said, well, isn't that good? It's like, that's what good, good monks do, don't they, and good people? Not the Philotimo ones. That's not enough. They're more hungry for virtue. He had a good kind of unrest, a, a kind that yearned for something to fill his soul. You see how that good uneasiness that we talk about that's necessary for the heterodox to feel that they're missing something and they come to the church? That's, that's true for everyone in the church. All of us need to feel this good uneasiness, this good unrest. I need more. I need to do more. I need to struggle more. I need to be with Christ more, right? He yearned for something to fill his soul. That yearning is so, so, so basic, so important. His eager goodness beckoned him to give himself over to greater struggles for the sake of which he sacrificed his strength, his time, and his rest. I have somebody in my, I'm not going to say who it is, I have somebody in my life, they like to sleep a lot. Oh, that's sweet. Rest, sleep is sweet, right? They put your head on that pillow and you go to bed and you wake up and it's cool in the morning or, you know, whatever. And, oh, yeah, okay, he didn't want that. He didn't want those consolations. He didn't want the basic human consolations that all of you and I, and first of all, I, are looking for. He offered everything to God. He thought of others before he thought of himself, and he sacrificed himself to help them. Everything was offered to God. An example of his self-sacrifice, even at the point of shedding blood, is captured in the following story. He says, when I was a young monk, I was pulled in every direction. And one day, when I had a lot of work, a fisherman came and said to me, come and help me pull up the nets. So he's probably at Esfigmenu, is what I'm guessing, because they were on the shore there. That's just what I'm guessing. I don't know. It doesn't say. Come and help me pull up the nets. I went right away without giving a thought to my own condition. He'd been working all day. At the Monastery of Esfigmeno, he worked like a dog. I mean, it was amazing. Read the life and you'll see. Without giving a thought to my own condition, I went right away. I was exhausted from work and asceticism. And as soon as I grabbed the nets to pull them up, I started hemorrhaging. Blood was spraying out like a fountain. It was hard to get it to stop because he had the condition where he had this sensitivity. And so he literally was shedding blood for the sake of helping this fisherman who just said, come and help me. Siloan, that's exactly right. The, one of the great virtues, one of the great things that we see in the life of St. Joseph of Hesychus is exactly determination, right? Determination. This is what's so important, right? Determination, zeal every day to the end of their life. The elder was moved when he saw eager goodness or philotimo in others, and he frequently spoke of such instances as examples to be emulated. A woman, he says, once said, Christ is grieved, and I'm the one who grieved him, so I don't want to have joy. But she was filled with joy. She would tell people to pray to have pain of heart for Christ instead of joy. Pray to have pain of heart. Don't pray for joy. Pray for pain of heart. Now, that's what 
Filotimo is. That's what eager goodness is. The more she said this, the more she'd have joy and delight. So she would pray for pain of heart, tell other people to pray for pain of heart, say that I don't want to have joy because Christ was uh, uh, grieved, and therefore I don't want to have joy since Christ was grieved, and yet joy is what she had. Joy is what she had. Because she had gone out of herself, she had sought the, the, the higher things, the better things for nothing but Christ's sake. His advice helped us to understand, the author is talking, Elder Isaac, but Elder Ephemios, actually, the author, because Elder Isaac reposed in the middle of the writing of the book. Uh, he advised us, he advised, his advice, rather, helped us to understand, to love, and to acquire philotimo, eager goodness, in all our actions. Quote, he would say, this is the advice he would give. We should do the right thing, not legalistically, or to get something out of it, but simply for the love of God. This reminds me of the three higher, the three types of salvation in the patristic text. We have the lowest one is the one who's seeking to avoid damnation. The middle one is the one who's seeking to gain something, paradise. And the third one is simply wants the love of God, simply wants Christ, doesn't want anything, right? This is what St. Paisius was doing. I don't want paradise, he said. I just want Christ. I want to serve Christ, love Christ, be for Christ. This is so key. This is the key to making real progress in the spiritual life. For Christ and in Christ. Nothing else. I don't care about anything else. I don't need consolations. I don't need rewards. I don't need praise. I don't want any of that. I just want Christ and, and, and him in, in, in everything, right? Christ all in all. We should do the right thing, not legalistically, or get something to get something out of it, but for the love of God. Then it's easy for me not just to do the things I'm supposed to do, but also to sacrifice whatever I'm entitled to. Oh, how different that is from our society of entitlements. Socialism, writing checks where we don't, we don't have the money, we're in debt. I mean, the whole mentality today is the exact opposite. I'm entitled to X, Y, Z, right? Why do I have to sacrifice? Imagine if we had, people had, like, there were thousands of people like St. Paisus, that, not the, the great saint, but, I mean, just had the love of, of God and Philotimo. I mean, what would happen to our society? What would happen to our community? What would happen to our parish? What would happen to our family? If our whole family lived with Philotimo, what do you want? You, I want you. Not my, not my will, but your will. I want what's good for you. If, if our children lived like that, if we lived like that, It would be so different, wouldn't it? He goes on, we should live and act with philotimo, with eager goodness. For example, children should think of how they can make things easier on their parents and make them happy. And we monks should know what gives our elder peace, and we should do it before he asks. So that's the same thing for children, right? You want children... You should know what your parents want and do it before they ask you. You want to, Your parents want you to clean up your room. Do it without asking. Your parents want you to get your clothes on and come and, and uh, eat dinner at a certain time or you know get up for breakfast and do your prayer rule. You don't need to be told again and again and again. Do it on your own. Do it for the love of Christ. Do it for the sake of your parents. Do it out of, out of love for your, your adult, the adults or whatever, right? Same thing with us, with parents. You know what they need. You know what they what the, what's going to help them. Do it without demanding anything from them, without them saying bravo or praising you, none of that. We shouldn't let someone else tire himself out of his chores, satisfying ourselves with the false notion that we've already finished our chores. This sounds like little children. I can hear my children. I already did mine. Why don't I do his? Well, I didn't make the mess. Why do I have to clean it up? Shows you how childish we are. That's how ch little children who, are, who don't know anything about, you know, like five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, whatever, right? Fortunately, increasingly 10-year-olds and 12-year-olds and 15-year-olds, we're not growing up. Uh, let's sacrifice ourselves for others. That's St. Paisus' message to us here in this chapter, Philotim, right? Do good earnestly and don't take advantage of other people's kindness. 
Another thing, like you go over to, there's so many examples in society today, among Orthodox, that we don't get it. We're not really doing it. We're not getting it. Um, I wish I could think of some, th- some things off the top of my head which are characteristic of, of our society today, but we don't even think, as Orthodox, we don't think like this. Right? We don't think, okay, uh, what, would, um, what would so-and-so, my neighbor, want? Oh, he wants that. I know that he likes that. I'll go bring it without a mask in. Uh, let's say we went over to somebody's house the other day <clears throat> that they really like watermelon. So the next time we go over, we make sure we bring lots of watermelon. Really simple things, right? We uh, That person really likes, um, I don't know, whatever. Figure it out. You guys can figure it out in your life. But that's how we, that's how we stand. A person who's earnestly good is showered with blessings, while a whiner, a complainer, just creates misery. You can't cleanse the heart with detergent, he says. It's eager goodness. It's Philotimo that does that. So you want to cleanse your heart? You want to cleanse your heart? Let's say you had a string of sins that you committed that still plague you, and you feel weighed down by them. And you're not, it's not enough just to say the prayer. It's not enough just to war against the thoughts that come to you. You got to do this. You got to be philotimo. That's how you cleanse the heart, he says. Live for your neighbor. Live for God and sacrifice. And that will be a cleansing of the heart. You ever thought about that? Have you thought that that's how you're going to clean your heart? If you're complaining about other people in your life, you're still not living for Christ and in Christ. If people are bad to you, They mistreat you. They complain about you. They bother you. They irritate you. Whatever. They're sinful. Whatever it is. And that's your focus. And you complain and bicker and moan. And your misery is shared abroad. You're not filotimo. You don't have eager goodness. You're not living for Christ and in Christ. You're you're a victim to the kind of egotism ultimately. Don't look around you. What is so-and-so doing? How does so-and-so treat me? How does so-and-so live? Who cares? What's on your business? Why do you care? Focus on yourself. Focus on Christ. A monk who only takes from his spiritual fathers never grows up. That's another thing. Spiritual children need to grow up, right? We, we go to, we, we don't, we're not going to be the same spiritual child we are in the first year in the third, in the fifth, in the tenth year, if we are, we're not growing. We're not going to be just like little children. Not going to go to their spiritual father every other day. Their father, I should say, every other day in the same way. Like if they're five year olds, they're going to be going constantly to their father, or a two year old, or a three year old, right? But a ten year old is not going to do that. A twenty year old certainly shouldn't be like that, right? So that's how it should be spiritually you have a spiritual father if in the beginning it's going to be intense you're probably going to have a lot of need but then you're going to grow up you're not going to have to have the need that you had then you're going to start to learn how to do the prayer rule do the you know you're going to know your conscience is going to inform you more and more you're going to it's going to be different you're going to be more functioning on your own like an old adult human being does too you don't go back continually to your mother when you're age 20 when you're 25, or you might already be married and have kids, you're not going to have the same relationship with your spiritual father after 10 or 20 or 30 years that you had in the beginning. It's the same thing. And the monk who does not grow up, only takes, 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 takes from his spiritual father, he's still a child. He has childish thinking. He doesn't sacrifice himself for others, so his heart remains hard, not maternal. You have to have a, look at that, what he said. A monk needs to have a maternal heart. Isn't that interesting? A monk needs to have a maternal heart, like caring for and loving others like a mother would. When he was a layman, and with this we end and we'll open it up for questions. When he was a layman, this characteristic virtue of the elder, philotimo, or eager goodness, showed himself, showed him to be the benefactor of the poor. When he was a soldier, it showed him to be a hero. And when he became a monk, it showed him to be a saint. Philotimo, right? Permeated St. Pius' whole life. All right, let's open it up for questions. And uh, again, I think this points to what we said earlier 
about uh, from El from Professor Chelengidis that you uh, you acquire the virtues whole, not piecemeal. You see how he had that love that permeated his whole life from a childhood, from the soldier to the monk. That was a constant in his life. That's the acquisition of the Holy Spirit again and again and again, going back again and again and again to the cross and through the cross to the resurrection and through the resurrection to the ascension and sitting at the right hand of God the Father and being like Christ, going from the image to the likeness, that whole eager goodness, philotimo, zeal, love of God for Christ and in Christ, not for consolations, not for the world, not for praise. That's the key that opens up the presence of the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in us, make, make his abode in us. And then from that flow all the virtues. From that we're patient, from that we're loving, from that we're kind, we're discerning, right? All the rest is manifest itself because we have that constant stance and constant desire to sacrifice and live for Christ. That's how things are. Not one by one, piece by piece, I'm going to become a better person. I'm going to do better in keeping the commandments. And it's all focused on my efforts. That's not, it's a, it's, of course you're going to struggle, but you're focused on Christ always. You're not, you're not focused on what you're doing. You don't have a self-consciousness like that, right? You kind of lose yourself in, in thinking of, constantly thinking of the others in Christ. All right, next, uh, first question. Father Bless, forgive my lengthy question. I was baptized on Pascha after a 13-month catechism prior to which I was studying orthodoxy and praying for about a year. Though I'm a babe in the faith, I indeed experienced much of this cacodoxy you mentioned. I'm often dismayed at the lack of people addressing these things, and I wonder what is my responsibility in these matters? I feel so much that I am utterly unqualified to address poor or wrong teachings as I am spiritually impoverished and very passionate. Yet there are priests around us who teach that the Catholic saints are valid, their mysteries are real, and that we can get sick from kissing icons. And I can't help but wonder if God is going to ask me, why didn't you say anything on the last day? And yet, I feel deeply that I need to greatly deepen my relationship and union with Christ before I'm of any use. I know that was long. Please forgive me, Father, and my dear brothers and sisters. Silwan, thank you for your question. I think it's a great question. I mean, whether you're one year Orthodox or two years, or you've had a 13-month catechism or eight-month catechism, look, we're all babes here. I'm going to remind you what I was told in a conversation with Father Stephanos Ananostopoulos, who is the author of many wonderful, tremendous books and a spiritual, co-spiritual son of Elder Ephraim. And he and I were discussing his book. This would have been 15 years ago, his book on divine liturgy and then his book on the, the um, creed. And we were talking about the state of things in Greece at the time. And he said, look, we're all catechumens today. That's how that's what we're like. We're like catechumens. All right. And this is in Greece, and this is a Greek priest telling you we're all like catechumens. All right. So don't this whole idea that I'm nobody and I'm somebody, that's good. You you and I are nobodies. We're the last of the last Christians. Right? We're weak, we're sinful, we don't we don't have much self-knowledge. We get all that. However, however. What do we see in the gospel? Who were the ones shouting Hosanna in the highest when he walked into Jerusalem? The Pharisees who had become teachers of the law. Who? The children. Children recognized his divinity and shouted Hosanna in the highest. They're the ones. And he said, they said, do you see, do you hear? The Pharisees said, do you hear what they're saying? And the Lord said, if I was to silence them, the rocks would shout out. Right. So this is the nature of all of creation, that we recognize the divine humanity. We recognize the truth of Christ and his gospel. We recognize the church for what it is, being the body of Christ. You're not seeing and feeling these things and understanding the errors because you're special, or because you're such a great ascetic, but because anyone who has been illumined and given the given the gift of salvation in the church, given the gift of the grace of God in the church, and is trying even just pathetically 
to love Christ and be faithful, they're going to give God's going to give them the sense of the discernment of what's true and what's false. Like what's that's that's a part of being a Christian. And so that's like a, a characteristic of a Christian. Now, there are many levels to that. Right. And the discernment we see in the life of St. Paisus obviously is far beyond. But these are these are so basic, these things that you're talking about, that you recognize it. You say, well, that can't be right. I mean, let's go back to say, to say to remind ourselves what you just said is going on. And you're saying that can't be right. And maybe I need to speak out. You're not. This is not some great insight. This is like orthodoxy 101, Silouan. What did you say? There are priests around us that teach that the papal Protestant so-called saints, and forgive me for being harsh, but this is the reality. I'm telling you the truth. I'm not saying... I'm not, a, I'm not being a rigorous, I'm not being a zealot here. I'm just trying to use words with meaning, right? If we say there are Catholic saints, then there is a Catholic church outside of the one holy Catholic Catholic church, and there's holiness in that which we call heresy. I'm trying to be consistent with the whole patristic teaching and the reality of what the church is. And right, So we can't say and speak in a way that misleads people, and that's exactly what's going on, right? So what does it mean that? Like, Catholic saints are valid. What does that even mean? Like, what it, does the person who say that understand the implications of what they're saying? What's the ecclesiology behind that? Who is Christ then? Right? Because you're saying that in and through Catholicism, which we, the church has said for a thousand years, is a heresy and teaches and accepts heresy, not anything less, filioque and then papal infallibility and the Immaculate Conception, which is at least a very grave error and distortion, created grace, and on and on and on, right? The various other smaller, so-called smaller problems. These are all expressions of a distortion and a falling away from the spirit of truth. So how is it possible for us to talk about holiness, Christ, there where we also say is delusion and heresy? Those two things can't coexist. And certainly not through and in Catholicism is anyone being sanctified. It might be in spite of, because of their love and simplicity, because they never heard of orthodoxy, never heard of gospel. I don't know what Christ is doing in spite of Catholicism or in spite of whatever, right? But certainly not through and in. We cannot say that because then we undo the confession of the faith of the saints. We undo the dogmatic teachings of the church. We undo the un, the identity of the church when we say that that is the church, that is Christ, that is the grace of God, that is holiness. So whoever's speaking, this priest that you're talking about, is very confused, if not heretical, deluded. I don't know what to say. This is ecumenism. This is what's happening, what's coming, not far from us, a false union based on these kind of strange and distorted sentiments and not... These are not words inspired by God, all right? So you are recognizing that, and it's really basic to recognize that. It's not a great achievement. I don't want, I'm not trying to badger you. I'm just saying that you don't have to feel like, oh my gosh, who am I? Who, who are you? You're an Orthodox Christian. That's all you got to be. Like, you're, not, you're nothing special, but you're an Orthodox Christian. You're Orthodox. You know what is right and what is wrong on these levels. This is basic. 101 orthodoxy. I believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. You confess it every Sunday. We all do. What does it mean? Well, it means we can't say that. That's one of the things it means. So what is the priest doing? What is he talking about? Right? Their mysteries are real mysteries. What does that mean? That means Christ is there. Christ is there. Or if Christ is there, the church is there. The church is one. So now we have a church that is orthodox and heretical. That's not possible. We can't say that. Are they thinking beyond sentiment? Are they sentimental and they're coming, they're, they're falling into this delusion? What's going on? How's it possible? We can get kissed, we can get sick from kissing icons. Well, what is an icon? Do you even know what an icon is? How can you say that we get sick from kissing an icon? What is the grace of God then? How does it work in our life? Why are, what does the Seventh-day Communal Council say about icons? It says that if you kiss them. You should be worried that maybe you're going to get sick. Or I mean, do we have anything in the patristic uh, literature that leads us to believe that venerating God and His saints will make us sick? Because that's what we're doing. The honor goes to the saints. 
It is so small and so materialistic to think in terms of, well, there's a glass, and on the glass there could be saliva, and in the saliva there could be sickness. If that's how we're thinking, we're materialists. We have no, where's the grace of God? Where's the workings of God? Where's the protection, the province of God? If we go that route, we're over, folks. Just throw the tower in. We're dead spiritually. We're, there's no way we can think like that and be Orthodox Christians. There's no room for the grace of God and his protection. You think St. Pius just thought like that? You think St. Pius would have for a second say, don't kiss the icons, don't kiss each other. You know, close down the churches, put a mask on. I mean, it's so unbelievable. You can't even imagine. And that's exactly what his disciple and the author of this book said. St. Pius would never do this. He would never take a vaccine. He would never put a mask on. He would never be afraid of his brother and sister in the middle of the worst pandemic. It wouldn't happen. He didn't live like that. The saints don't live like that. Okay, so you are you are seeing things that are so obvious to babes, right? You're like the babe on the path to Jerusalem. And you're saying, Hosanna in the highest. Of course, Hosanna in the highest. He just raised Lazarus. You, you children who have no special interest, you understand who he is. You, the babe, the new one, Siloam, and all of us babes, latest and, and worst and, and weakest of all the Christians, in spite of that, we see the obvious. The church is one. The church is holy. The church is Christ. Of course you should say something. In all humility and love, Father, help me to understand. You don't have to go there and teach and preach. Ask questions. Father, how? I don't understand. All the things I just told you, make them into questions. And bring them to your Father and God and say, how, Father? How is it possible, Father? Right? How is it possible, Father? Next question. Oh, sorry. So anybody coming to this, I didn't hit the button for answering. So I just finished that. All right, next is Nectaria. Father Bless, you mentioned the last St. Paisio's talk about making prospera, and that traditionally they were made by someone pure and usually older ladies. What does this mean for someone younger in marital relations? Are there specific rules to follow? Thank you. You need to speak to your spiritual father, Nectaria. Hopefully he understands the tradition of the church. Uh, generally, it is the tradition that those who are active and having sexual relations are not making prosphora. And if they do, I don't, I don't know. Generally, it doesn't happen, but it, like, I suppose it could, but there would be abstinence for a time. And that is not some legalistic, moralistic reason. There's nothing bad about sexual relations, but we offer our best. And, our, and we offer our prayers. And St. Paul himself said, there's a time when you do not come together and you do it for prayer, right? Greater prayer and, 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 and attention to God. And then there's a time when you come together. So the time you don't come together during Great Lent, during the fast of the apostles, the fast of the mother of God, during the fast of Christmas, then you can make prosphora and you can offer your offering to God in the midst of prayer and fasting. That's just how it is. That's how we do it out of fear and love of God, that's how we approach the holy things. All right? If that didn't answer your question, feel free to write me or ask me again in the comments. John H. I love pamphlets and booklets. booklets. <clears throat> People uh, are sometimes more receptive than with receiving a book. I've also left orthodox booklets or insulates in a hotel room, drawers, or buses. However, many booklets include iconography in its cover or contents. Is this wrong to do since someone can throw it in the trash or defile it? I've wondered, since Father Athanas Matinos has said to pass things out, St. Lydia, the catacomb new martyr of Russia, would print prayers and lives of saints, but if it has iconography, I'm not sure. Well, this is a good question, I, and I don't have a great answer for you, John, but I think it's a great question that we should search more and get a better answer for. 
I've seen two schools of thought, and I don't see them always being consistent. So I've never got a clear, like, absolute no icons on covers of books. Obviously, if you look at our books, we have icons on the covers. The Life of St. Paisius has his icon on the cover. Uh, many, many uh, books do, uh, and they're produced by pious people, uh, disciples of saints. So I don't see that there is a consensus that we, we must avoid printing icons on books. However, I do remember once speaking to El, uh, Constantine Carvanos, um, who I revered as a, a very uh, holy uh, layman, like an elder in the world kind of thing in terms of his just piety and love. And he did express reticence for icons and covers, although later on I saw that his whole series of saints had icons and covers. So I, I don't think I, that one has, you can say, well, there's a consensus, don't put icons and covers of books. So, uh, yeah, I don't know what to say. I think it's a problem uh, that if you know or it's likely that they're going to be defiled, you probably should avoid it. You don't throw the pearls before the swine. So if you think that you're going to leave a pamphlet somewhere and it's going to end up being in the trash and, no, and it's not going to be respected, it's not going to be read, respected, probably don't leave it there then, right? Um, Maybe that there's a good case to be made that we have a whole series of pamphlets for non-Orthodox that at least don't have it on the cover. But the, on the other hand, John, we teach so much with the icon. Like this teaches. Just looking at this right here, right? Let's see if we can get that. Doesn't that teach? Can you imagine that without the icon of the Mother of God? Would it not be? It would be much less powerful and instructive. Right? It would be much plainer. When you see this and you see that helmet of salvation, I think that it's a far more effective uh, message and, uh, and, and, and missionary tool. Uh, and I think that if I was to weigh things out, I would say, well, okay, we're not intending these things ever to be dis, dis, misused. We're giving them to Orthodox Christians. Uh, we might even say, you know, make sure you don't throw this away. I don't know, whatever. But we're doing what I can, due diligence, that this not be defiled, not be mistreated. I think at that point, it's a missionary tool. God wants these people to see and be moved to repentance or whatever. And then I think it's blessed in that context. Right? Our books are not generally given out. Almost all of our books and all of our pamphlets are for Orthodox Christians. And so if I was to do something for a totally non-Orthodox crowd and I was giving it out for free and I was just like throwing it everywhere on bus stops and I think we would avoid the icon at least on the cover at least on the cover if not throughout so I think that's the distinction I don't know again I don't have a hard good answer for that but that's what I can tell you Father Bless can you recommend a monastery for me I live in Ventura California I don't remember where Ventura is that's southern right southern California Aristotle well, in California, Southern California, the, the biggest, most uh, traditional Athenite monastery that exists in Southern California is in Dunlop, California, uh, northeast of Fresno, or even maybe just east of Fresno, I think. East of Fresno, I think. And uh, it's in Dunlop, California. And it's a woman's monastery. It's life-giving spring. Life-giving spring. The abbess is Markella. And it's a woman's monastery, but it's a beautiful, beautiful place. You can go and stay, I think, next door and visit the monastery and the services. Now, if you're looking for a men's monastery, then I guess the one I'd have to recommend in California, and I'm not, I might be missing one or two smaller monasteries, would be Platina up in Northern California, in Platina, California, not far from Mount Sash, Shasta, uh, on the on, on Highway Five, uh, on your way to Oregon, and that's where Father Seraphim Rose lived, and uh, Father Damascene is the abbot, and I would say that would be the next men's monastery. But there's also here in Arizona, if you're in Southern California, it's probably even a shorter drive than Platina, and that is Saint Anthony's Monastery. Uh, in Florence, Arizona. All right. So those are the three big 
established older monasteries within a day's drive, a long day's drive or a shorter day's drive uh, from, I think you're in the LA area, right? So that would be the, I don't think, I don't know of any other monasteries that are closer to you that I, you know, I can have, I have experience with that I can recommend. Does anybody want to jump in on that? All right. Just looking at your comments here. Uh, I missed them. Uh, what about churches that have icons in front of them? What's the question? Icons outside the church's door, you mean? What about them? Not sure. Siloan says, of course, I've never been afraid of getting sick from any of these things. Thank God. It is so sad to hear and see some who are. God help them. I did even become violently sick on four occasions since 2023 began, and it was always given, God given and served to humble me greatly. Oh, that's good, Siloan. John says, Constantine Cabranos used to lecture at our church often during Lenten retreats. He gave us the education we needed to counteract the secular pseudo education we received in high school and university. That's wonderful, John. That's a great blessing. All right. St. Paisius, I forgot that. St. Paisius Monastery. Thank you, uh, Jacob uh, and Christina. There's St. Paisius Monastery here in Arizona as well. Uh, for, um, let's see, who was that asked me? Just now, whoever asked me, I forget. Uh, Aristotle. Aristotle, there's also the monastery of St. Paisius in Safford, Arizona, about three hours north east of us here in Florence. It's a women's monastery, and that's a, another very good monastery. Okay, so John has another question. <clears throat> if the virtues are not gained piecemeal, this doesn't mean that when we progress somewhat with God's help that our passions all go away. I think I'm missing something here with your emphasis on the virtues not being piecemeal, but how does this relate to our continual falls and passions? About an hour in, I think I get it. This is contrasted to a sec secular materialist just giving charity or being good with some individual virtue without doing so for Christ. Well, that's a big part of it. Yes, John. A big part of that is we we, we autonomize and we think that we can do things uh, and be virtuous without Christ, without uh, the truth, without you know any reference to eternal life. That's certainly a big part of it. But I think what I want to say also is with regard to how it's relate to our continual falls and passions. Um, so how can we explain that? that? That's a good question. So, yeah. Uh, We are volatile, right? We are we are weak. We're 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 constantly changing. We, we in Greek we would say krepti, which would be I guess just changeable. And so the big discussion, the Christological discussions, used to be in the fourth century. You know, is Christ treptos? Is he is he changeable? And of course, the answer is no. Not and God is not like us in that. So we're not fickle. Uh, he's not fickle. We are so. Um, so the weakness uh, and the inability for us to become constant in virtue um, is something different. In other words, you are given the when you have the grace of God and he dwells within you and you're making progress and you fall away from that. It's not that you have part of the virtue, like you fall away from virtue. You fall away from the grace of God and then you fall. Right. First, you lose the grace of God, then you fall. So the grace of God is the wholeness, the fullness, and his presence is what imparts to us the, 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 the virtue, what makes us virtuous. So when we fall away from that, we become, you know, alienated from the grace for a time, even for a moment or even for minutes or even for, you know, months. It doesn't matter. But that state of falling away is not like, oh, we still obtain some virtues. 
we we lose everything when we lose the grace of God, and we gain everything when we gain the grace of God. Uh, you know, we don't start from scratch again. We pick up where we left off, maybe. You put it that way. But I don't think that that is that undoes the whole question of not obtaining virtues piecemeal. The fact that you can fall away from virtue and grace does not mean, therefore, you can obtain it piecemeal. Does that make sense? Look forward to John. Tell me if that makes sense. Okay. Next question. Diane, start. Uh, let's see. Uh, what is the difference between spoiling our children and giving them what they need, Father? Bless. The Lord bless you. Okay. So it is not sinful to acquire or seek out that which is necessary for us to live and breathe and live and work and be, and be healthy in this society. All right. So the distinction is what is necessary beyond that? You know, the prost zine, we say in, in Greek, the, that which is necessary for life. All right. So if you teach them and you give them what they need to live and to thrive as Orthodox Christians, you are giving them what is blessed. If you go beyond that and constantly uh, teach them to desire more and indeed things that are vain, things that are passing, things that are we try, we should try always to whatever we're doing in this society, which is so easy to get off track and to become fixated or focused on things that are passing or dead. We try at least within that when we're educating our children or when we're allowing for entertainment, you know, downtime, go uh, read a book or watch this documentary or whatever we're doing. Hopefully that's all is still in the context of formation, edification which is necessary for life in this world, right? Which is necessary for them to live and to be a part of the society. So I think that when you start getting into vain things, that's when you know you're spoiling them. When you're starting to do things that are clearly egotistical and vain and not beneficial for them or their brother or their relationship with Christ, none of the above. And you're just like, oh, let's go do X. And it just, there's no, there's no, teaching there's no edification there's no spiritual edification there's no sacrifice there's nothing right it's just pure entertainment without any edification and usually that means that it's harmful like if we watch movies that are harmful to our souls uh, so you have to strive constantly to, and teach your children your time is short your time is limited use it wisely everything you do do it in the context of for Christ, for the sake of that which is blessed, the blameless, let's say, passions, you know, of eat and sleep. Those are blameless passions. God does not condemn us because we have to eat and sleep. Now, if we sleep excessively, we eat excessively, that's a different issue. So when you go beyond, you go to excess, you go to vanity, that's when you're in the realm of spoiling your children. You'll have to find the the balance on your own with your spiritual father. I can't give you that in a 45 second answer. Maria, Mary Petra. Father blessed. There is a short version of the Philogalia for lay people edited by Anthony Conyaris, published by Light and Life Publishing Company. Are you familiar with this book and can you recommend it as good beginning of the Philogalia? Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, I do remember that book. I didn't spend much time with it. I didn't find it. At the time when I did see it, I don't have the book. I didn't find it, you know, particularly. Oh, I need I need to read this. But I I'm guessing what he just did was he took portions of the. I'm just guessing. I have not read the book, so I can't really tell you for sure. But I'm guessing he took portions of the Fugalia. Maybe he's got some commentary in there. I don't remember. And they're going to be maybe more beginner application. I'm guessing. I don't know. My concern would be. I mean, in that sense, it's probably. A way to begin looking at the philosophy. Yeah, my problem, my concern is that it could be taken out of context or misinterpreted by him as the author. I don't know that to be the case, but that would be my concern. Um, the Philokalia, properly speaking, the five volumes are wonderful to read, but really they have some presuppositions that we don't always meet. 
right? We're not living the life that they presuppose. They're a little bit like what St. Ignatius was saying. Now, having said that, I don't want to say don't read it. I'm just saying you have to realize that. Keep that in mind. Like I'm reading a book that was written for anchorites, people who, who are who have departed from even the synobium, right? They're not even living in the community. They're now mostly in one or two or three, uh, and they're off on their own, and they're practicing noetic prayer. That's the, the core of a lot of the texts. There are other texts, too, that are more applicable. So you need to be discerning what's text. There's an order, actually. Father Maximus Constance has drafted an order of how to read the Philogalia, it's really important that we read it in its order. I don't have that in front of me right now. I don't know if I can easily find it. Uh, but if we do find that, uh, Daniel or, uh, I'm sorry, Justin or whoever's here from the team, if we find that, it would be a good thing to post in the Telegram group how and what order to read the Philokalia. Uh, generally speaking, I think it's not a bad idea to read the sacred texts that are, are clearly have a lot of presuppositions that we don't always meet. but to keep that in mind and not go off at all without spiritual direction and go, go off, you know, on a tangent. Um, for instance, Elder Hieronymus, famous elder from Greece, said that we should read one page a day from St. Isaac the Syrian, one page a day. Uh, something like that for the Philogalia. Right? Don't, don't delve into it like you fulfill all the presuppositions and you're ready to go and start the Jesus prayer. You're not. You know, you're you and I, 90% of us here tonight, if not 99, are not ready to do that. Um, and so we need spiritual guidance on when and how. So hopefully we can get that, that, that was from Father Maximus. That would be good to share. Daniel, should laymen, beginners, read the Ladder of Divine Ascent? I just answered that basically with the Philokalia. All right. So yes, but as a novice who's not living the life, probably, I can't, I don't know, you personally, but I think most of us, if not 95, 99% of us, are not leading the same life that was presupposed when they wrote the book. Does that mean we shouldn't read the book? No, but we should read it with that in mind and with spiritual guidance. And if we have questions, we take them to spiritual fathers and we don't run off, right? We don't become, this is the problem with reading these texts. If you don't have any humility and really understand how weak we are today, you could fall into delusion if you think, I'm going to go do this now. On my own, I'm going to go put all this into practice. No, you're not. You Nobody does that. Even the monk in the monastery takes it to the spiritual father and says, how do I put this into practice? All right? Nobody does that. So that's really important. The context is super important. So, you, you know, read a little bit, one, one page a day. We can't even digest a couple sentences, if we want to be honest. Are we really putting even those sentences into practice? I mean, we read to put things into practice. We don't read to be... You know, oh, how wonderful. What a great book. Like, I read novels, and then I read the Philokalia. No. No, that's not what we do. We read the spiritual life books, lives of saints even, but so much more of their writings like these, the Philokalia, the Evergetinos, the uh, St. Isaac the Syrian, and all these texts that are exalted texts of exalted lives. We read them in order to put into practice. But we can't really put a lot of that in practice because we're not there yet, right? So... We're going to get inspired by that, be challenged by that, but that's it's going to be limited to what we can do with it. It's still going to be beneficial, but in a way that's going to be probably limited to most of us in terms of how we live our life today. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, well, there you go. You can share it here, too. Uh, Justin, you could also share it here if you have a link to an online source. I didn't know you had that. So if you have that, you could also share it here, the link, if you have a link. Okay, um, I can also share it in Patreon. Justin, you can send it to me. We can share it in Patreon as well. All right, last two questions, then we're going to call it a night. Last two questions, then we're going to call it a night. I do want to ask, what, I, what was the poll I was going to make before the end? Anybody remember what I said in the beginning? I was going to do a poll toward the end. I forget now. I have just moved to the States. This is from Henry Suters. Henry Suters. Where are you coming from? Where are you moving from, Henry? 
Uh, I've just moved to the States. There's an OCA parish near me and a road corps mission. With only knowing that, would you recommend one over the other or should I just check out both and then decide? I think you should check out both and then decide. Have in mind, I don't know where you are. I mean, if you told me where you are, you told me some things, I could probably give it. But I can't. Even then, I wouldn't be able to tell you for sure. So you probably should visit both. Um, but have in mind that the ROCOR generally inclines a little more toward tradition in terms of, you know, not always the case. Some are wonderful. There's wonderful OCA pairs with priests who are very traditional. I'm just saying, generally speaking, ROCOR tends toward more traditional orthodoxy on a variety of things. Uh, in terms of reception, usually they baptize, you know, things like that. So have that in mind. Ask a lot of questions uh, and take your time. And uh, and then if you have questions, you can bring them here if you want, or you can, uh, you know, go to whatever, your spiritual father, whatever. But, yeah, I would say take it a step at a time and see. Jacob, is it a normal practice for a priest to do the prayers before confession as a group before confessing each person individual? Um it's not very common. No, I have not seen that. It's not bad. There's the prayers before com- confession from the prayer book, if that's what I understand that he's doing, uh, are pretty basic and straightforward. So, and it's a practical thing of reading them once for everybody. I guess everybody's there then. Everybody shows up for confession and they wait for like two hours until he confesses them. That's pretty rare itself. Most people show up at a particular time. And they try to go confession just, you know, I don't know where you are. You didn't give me any context. Like, are you in the OCA, Rocor, Greeks? Uh, they do things a little differently, not much, but there's some slight differences. But uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. It's just not very common. It's not, it's not always practical to do that. Uh, so somebody, Kimberly asked, uh, is quality more important than quantity in terms of the Jesus prayer? Yes, absolutely. Quality is always more important than quantity. Oh, that's good. Thank you for the link. Thank you for the link here. Blogs about reading the Philokalia. Uh, that's, there you go. There's the link from uh, Justin. And then there's another, uh, link apparently. Path of Entry to Philokolia by Monk. Okay, so there's several sources there in our Patreon page. But if we want to go for our folks over at, um, what's the best link to give them over there, over at Orthodox Ethos? Probably we'll go with Kaufman's blog spot. I didn't know John Kaufman had a blog spot. What did I, how did I miss that? Uh, all right, so here is, Um, for everybody over at Orthodox Ethos, this is a link to that introduction to the Philokalia, how to read it, in what order, johnkaufman.blogspot.com, 2020, 01 reading dash Philokalia. There you go. All right. For all of you over at Orthodox Ethos and don't see our chat here at Patreon. Okay. So. I think we've come to the end of our discussion. Now, let me tell you some announcements. Announcements, announcements. We need to make those announcements also in writing, but I'll tell you verbally right now. Tomorrow night, Thursday night, we have a regular question and answer session. Today is Wednesday. Tomorrow is Thursday the 20th. Again, happy feast day for Prophet Elias tomorrow. Friday, we have finally, I hope, I hope everybody got the book, but we're going to have to do it anyway because next week we have a big week of uh, book launching and convention and all kinds of things. We're not going to be able to do it next week. So Friday, this week, right here in, in Patreon Crowdcast and over at Orthodox Ethos, we'll be live streaming the question and answer session for the book, uh, The Life and Witness of St. Jacobus of Evia. Whoever bought that, and wants to join us and bring your questions about that book and discuss St. Yaakovus' life, that's Friday at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Tomorrow night, our regular question and session. Now, next week, I haven't determined it yet, but it's likely we will not have a teaching on Tuesday night. Likely. Although, 
I may change that. Look for an announcement on Tuesday morning, one way or the other. Tomorrow, uh, I'm sorry, on Monday, we begin a week-long intense uh, presence at the Antiochian Archdiocese General Convention, Uncome Out and Press, that is, is going to have a table, or actually three. We're going to have all of our books. We're going to have our new book. Uh, let me actually share that with you. I've, did I show you the uh, hardcover edition? I don't remember. This is exciting for us at Uncommanded Press. We've got uh, two new hardcovers out. First of all, I'll tell you this one. It's now in hardcover. This is on the Dogma of the Church by St. Hilarion. Dogma of the Church. It's in hardcover. Very exciting. You can get that. It's not cheap, but it's available. And then we have in hardcover our very important big release coming up next week on the reception of the heterodox into the Orthodox Church. Uh, this is the full new edition. I love these flaps. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? I love that. That's our designer, George. We love his work. And so that's going to be out, uh, coming out very soon here. All right. So. Uh, that is next week. Uh, we're launching it on a Monday. There'll be all the, uh, the perks and the, uh, sorry, the, uh, uh, stay tuned. You'll see it on Patreon. You'll see it all over the social media everywhere. Uh, all week we'll be posting reviews. We're going to go all throughout the next month. We'll have a whole bunch of podcasts on it. Uh, we're going to have all kinds of reels and videos and endorsements and it's just going to be a, a very intense um week and month uh for uncommon press now we're going to be at the Antiochian general convention from monday to the following sunday and so i don't think i don't think but i'll try to, i don't think i'm going to be able to do a, a teaching on tuesday because we're going to be at the convention and then uh, a question and answer, probably more likely that I'll be able to do a question and answer session because I don't have to prepare much for that. But uh, so Thursday, I'll try. It all depends on what's going on at the convention. But Tuesday, mm, not sure. All right. That's next week. So, again, tomorrow night, question and answer. Friday night, question and answer, St. Jacobos. Next Tuesday, may or may not have a teaching. Next Thursday, most likely going to try to do a question and answer session. Next Monday, the launch, all week, big deal for us. And I hope that all of you acquire the book, tell others to acquire the book, share throughout social media. Very important launch for us. We want to see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of purchases for this book. We want this book to go everywhere. Very, very important for the church. We've been working on this for years. We really think this is a big deal. And so we hope that you'll support it uh, and be edified by it, right? Because it's very edifying. Uh, the book is very edifying for all of us. All right. If I don't see any more questions and... The poll has been answered thoroughly. Dude, what was the poll? Did anybody remember the poll that I said I was going to do? Let's see if anybody answered me. Jack Timothy says, please pray for St. Paul the Apostle Monastery in Boscobo, Wisconsin. is a newly established Athenite-style English-speaking monastery in Rocor and Father Manas from St. Anthony's in Arizona recently moved there to be their spirit. Yeah, that's fantastic. I didn't know they had a new name. I thought they were going to be called St. Isaac Syrian Skeet. So now they've renamed the monastery St. Paul the Apostle. That's interesting. I wonder how Father Manas came to that name. But that's wonderful. Thank you for having uh, sharing that with us. Yes, Marie, we do. We also hope that many priests in the, in the convention buy the book. Uh, so I don't remember. You forgot to. Christina forgot to. Okay, so then don't worry about it. It's not that important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And pray. And I hope tonight's been edifying. You, you understand better what the virtues are, how to acquire them. Filotimo, filotimo, filotimo. That's so key. So now... Tonight, tomorrow, the next day, keep it in mind. Try to apply it. Try to live it. 
What can you do for others without anything in return? What can you do for Christ without any con any consolation, human consolation? Turn to your left and right and start to imitate St. Paisius and pray for me that I can do the same. 